Okay, as long as I'm not, I'm good. <laughs> no, it takes you I've had to a time or two. Uh, let me start out by saying good to have all of you here. We don't have as many tonight. But one of the things that we said we would do is that we are going to, because this is a course that we're going to start tonight, that we feel is uh, of real significance and importance. We're going to the elders have decided that we will do this online. Part of the reason we don't do everything online is because now that the COVID situation has gotten so much better, uh, we don't want to become a handicap to others who might want to go and worship somewhere else. And, uh, and then because they're watching here, they won't. So we'd rather them go, if that makes sense. So anyhow, uh, but and, and also for the last, as you know, 10 weeks, we haven't Get this going better. That's better. We haven't been able to do anything online because uh, we were doing the Jewel Miller film series, and that, of course, is a copyrighted series, and we can't can't do that. But we will tonight. So, yeah. When you're um, uh, all called message got cut off. You're, everything you're going to talk about Fourth of July is cut off right here. Did it really? Okay. Huh? I know what was going on. I, I'm gonna go over it, but uh, thank you for telling me that. It came on again the second. Oh, it did come on again. Oh, okay, so we did hear. Well, we'll 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 tell it. Uh, let me go over a few uh, things, and then we'll get into what Glenn's talking about. Um, from the standpoint of sick, uh, Linda Hicks asked me Sunday to remember her friend, and I'm going to mention her friend. Some of you may know who this lady is. Her name is Bonnie Cook, and Bonnie is a, <clears throat> as most of you know, Linda has worked for a number of years for Burton King, I don't think locally here, somewhere else. Plus town. And Bonnie is a, a manager at one of the Burger Kings here in town. I went to visit her one time, and I think she since has changed, but the one she was at was the one over here across from, uh, or next to, or across from CBS. You guys know who that is. But anyhow, Bonnie has asked for prayers for the church. Uh, Bonnie Cook is her name. She's had several issues. She's been in the hospital. And uh, I've gone to visit her. She's at, she's at, all, said she'd come, and, and we'll keep praying that she will. But let's certainly pray for her recovery. Bonnie Cook. And then some of ours, and I'll mention these, and there, there may be you, some you know of. Let me just give you some updates on some of those that are ours that we've mentioned that are sick. Benny Carr, uh, I was just telling Camilla, he's almost a week from his knee replacement surgery, and he is doing really well, he told me today. And for those of you who know a little bit about this, uh, he has already gotten to 115 degrees in terms of his flexion and extension, and uh, or flexion. And uh, that simply means this. He's almost to come back, bring his heel back so he can touch his seat of his britches. And that's where you're supposed to be, at 120 degrees. So he's at 115 after a week. And I told Camilla, she's had knee replacement surgery, that he probably is setting a record for rehab, which I told Benny that, and he just kind of laughed. But uh, that's really good. He is doing exceptionally well. He has high hopes of being with us uh, next, this upcoming Sunday. Now, he says he's uh, he's in a little pain, not much, uh, but he is off of his pain meds. He doesn't want to take them, and uh, so he's doing real well. We're thankful for that, and I know many of you were concerned about him, and, and he's doing super. Talk to Ellen Hill again. Ellen is doing exceptionally well, too, her anemia, with her anemia. Her hemoglobin count is back up to where it should be, but she still has fatigue right now. So she told me she couldn't come tonight, but she hoped to be here Sunday. So continue to remember her in your prayers. Uh, Kathy, a lot of you want to know about Kathy. Uh, she went to the doctor yesterday, and x-rays show that the pneumonia has nearly cleared up, but her lungs are inflamed with this asthma that was the thing that caused the pneumonia, and such that now that she needs to see a pulmonary specialist and a cardiologist because they think that her heart might be somewhat enlarged as a result of this. Now she's still weak and and, uh, 
and her appetite is getting better, but I would appreciate you continuing to remember her in your prayers as well. Any others that are sick that we need to mention? Okay. And, and so let me go ahead and tell you the announcement that was made over the all call if you didn't hear it. This has been planned for a while. Kathy and I had planned to do this, but but uh, and we really want to do it. We, we'll do it again. We, we just, uh, for whatever the reasons are, COVID I think is probably one of the main ones and then getting some repairs done at the house and so forth the first year. But anyhow, uh, we have wanted to have members of the church over to the house. Um, there's a big deck on the back of the house. Some of you know that, some of you may not. And so we wanted to have something on the 4th of July that had been our plan. But I don't think we're going to be able to do it at the house, just simply because I don't know that she'll be up to it. And I don't want to put her through anything with that right now. So we're going to continue, though, to have the fellowship. The elders said, please, let's do it. So we're going to do it Sunday night after services, being the 4th of July. And uh, we would encourage all of you to encourage, and, and that, that's what the, the, uh, the uh, all calls about today to come and be a part of that after services. We're going to try to start. I mean, when I say start, I mean start eating at 7. And we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs, just all American meal. And uh, I'm asking if you want to bring a side dish, uh, your favorite dish, beans, potato salad, chips, something like that. Or, or dessert and and drinks. All we were going to do was chips and hamburgers and hot dogs. But anything that you'd like to do like that, you're welcome to do. And then we're going to have a big fireworks show afterwards. So uh, I say big, you know, understand the analogy is big, but uh, it might not be as big as you might think. But anyhow, it's pretty good. I think it'll be good. Is it going to be at the fellowship building? Yeah, we're going to do it at the fellowship building. If you want to bring a lawn chair, what we'll do after we eat is we'll come and we'll all sit on this grass area. I have been thinking about this. We'll do all the fireworks out here in the parking lot area or back there where the, uh, you know, courts are and all that so we won't be around any cars we'll get everybody to move their car but uh, that is going to be on the fourth and i hope that you can come and be a part of that and bring friends if you'd like and uh, hopefully we'll have a good crowd for it we haven't had a fellowship in a while can i ask a question yeah well, do you need people to bring buns or have you got buns? got buns got hamburgers got hot dogs for about got, condiments. got condiments okay bring chairs or something you haven't got a little huh yeah. Bring your fold out chairs. Yeah, if you want to bring your fold out chairs to come, or you can take one of the white chairs out of the, we've already got the elders' approval, that we can take that out of uh, the uh, fellowship period. Sit down here too, it doesn't matter. Hopefully the, the, the weather will cooperate, you know how that is. But maybe we're all looking out the windows of the fellowship hall as it's raining and somebody's out there getting wet shooting fireworks. <laughs> Don't laugh, that's going to be you. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? Our friend, uh, yeah, uh, Tidley, is dire with his cancer. You know, he's trying some experimental, yeah, you know, some uh, you know, treatment. Oh, yeah. Want to remember Norm Rich? Yeah. He's a brother in Christ. Guys. He is uh, in the bulletin. So please remember him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to be here tonight as your people. And we're going to study God from your word, and we ask you, Lord, to help us clear our minds and hearts so that we can understand your word better. We can understand better, Lord, how to put it into practice in our lives and to show it to others so that we can be a great example before others and bring them to you. Help us, Lord, now that we would... Uh, Tender our hearts and our minds so that we can maybe pick up something more that we didn't know before that can make and enhance your word in our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you've got a handout in front of you. And I'm going to tell you that what how this I wish I could tell you how this is going to go. I, I can't. Because I've never done this before this particular study. So it's a first for me. Now I've been I've been a participant in some of this, but I want to I want to bring your attention to a couple of things before we start. This study is called How We Got the Bible. Simple. Now I read in 
Second uh, Peter, First Peter, three verse fifteen. I hear the words of Peter say, "But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts." That means set aside a place in your heart for God. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to any man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. You know, the very first time I heard that verse, I remember I was sitting in an audience, I must have been 22 years old, and I remember thinking to myself, I can't do that. I can't give an answer to anybody that asks me. Now, I, I, I think sometimes we think too, uh, maybe strongly about what that means in terms of, uh, you know, we should have the ability to, to quote the Bible, so to speak or to have every answer for every question. I don't think it means that. I think it means there's a hope in us, and what is that hope? What brings about that hope? Believing in Christ. Yeah, believing in Christ, being obedient to Christ, being having a willingness to do what He tells us to do, and then and being able to tell others that. You know, as it was brought out in the Sunday morning Bible class, you know, we're not only to teach and baptize, but we're also to what? Teach to Continue to teach. And so that is incumbent on us as those who sit in and learn also to also learn. So we want to understand some questions tonight and talk about some things. This is lesson one, and I anticipate this series because I told Kathy today as we were talking about this and I was trying to explain to her what was going to happen, and she said, well, this can get really involved. And I said, it can. And the worst thing that I can do is to give you information that doesn't tie together, that doesn't have connecting links. Things have to connect. See, we have to be able to understand why this is this way and what that triggers and what that leads to. Because if we're going to do that, and I'm, listen, I'm not asking you to be a Bible scholar tonight. I'm not asking you to be a Bible scholar. All I'm saying is, is simply saying is that we need to be able to understand God's Word and how we've got the Bible. Now, we're... we're you know, many, many centuries removed from when this book was written. And so some of the things that are said in the day, while we may not quite understand maybe how it's worded, and that we'll get we'll get to that later in some of these translations and so forth, we do need to be able to understand it to God's word, at least what he means. So let's look at the first and the outline there. And there's some scriptural text there, and these you already know. And uh, we'll be mentioning these some along the way. Paul told the Romans in chapter 15, verse 4, he said, The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. What does that mean? Who's he, what does he mean when he says to Roman Christians 2,000 years ago that the Old Testament, because of course the New Testament was just being written by them, right? These things were written for our learning. So these, the Bible is filled with stories that we are to what? Learn from. What are we to learn? But the character examples that they went through with and what's prevalent for us. Yeah. Examples, what's you know, what we have to do. But I think sometimes we miss the real point of this. And let me tell you what it really is. Here's the point that Paul wants you to know. If you read the context of that chapter, you'll find out. We need to know who God is and who we're dealing with here. You know, we may think, and we talked a little bit about this last night, that, that God is going to, He's so loving, and He is. He's so merciful, and He is. That regardless of what I do, He's going to be okay with it. And He's not. Because of His righteousness. He cannot tolerate sin. And the only reason He can tolerate you and I, because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, is because of what? The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. That's right. That's the only way. It's not a matter of love. It's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of doing what he says. It's always been that. So that's what Romans 15, 4 is talking about. These lessons we learn from the others and the mistakes they made. Listen. Now listen. I know you know this. As you, as you were growing up, and we're all older people now, but as you were growing up, you had probably, in most of your cases, had an older brother or sister or someone you watched get a spanking. <laughs> or maybe you had, as a parent, had to administer that and you watched your own children, younger children, watch a, a, the other one get a spanking or get punished or whatever the case may be. 
And the whole intent of that is that uh, hopefully they won't do what? The same thing. They won't do the same thing. They won't make the same mistake. I, I still re remember seeing my dad pull his big belt off and get to my younger brother one time. Now, he got me before, trust me. And uh, I, I had the most respect and reverence for him. But I didn't want to do the same thing Steve did. That was my brother. And the whole idea is that, isn't it? That's what the Bible teaches. Got all these stories that are here, we read about, we're going to talk about a little bit, and we get the invitation about King Saul. And uh, how Samuel said, and this is a text that we'll talk about a little bit in more detail later, but Samuel said to him in the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, he said, it is better to obey than to, who could finish that? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. And if you remember that story, you remember that Saul was like us. He had made a mistake by not obeying God. And it cost, and we'll talk about it later, as I said. But the point is, we, we need to understand who God is. And then, in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, the very first sermon I ever preached, I was baptized, uh, and four days later, a fellow named Iris Benson, who was a Bible teacher and English teacher at Alabama Christian College, told me in his class, he said, for your final grade in my class, you're going to preach the chapel. I looked and I said, you said what, Brother Miss? <laughs> I've never preached. I didn't have a clue about preaching. He gave me a little booklet. I wish I had that. And it was about the inspiration of the Bible. It was one of the best little booklets I'd ever seen. I don't know who wrote it. He just said, use this. Preach on this. And the key text was right there, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Well, who remembers what that says? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the Bible says that it came from who? God. And we're going to talk a little bit about that just tonight. And so the Bible tells us that it came from God. Now, there are people, there are skeptics, and I'm going to give you some, some things that today that's probably going to rock your world, so to speak, uh, when it comes to these statistical things, because they did mine. That's what I was studying about. So, but, but that's a scripture that we'll be looking at many times. And then, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, the Apostle Peter says that, that no scripture came by what? Private interpretation. But holy men of God did what? They were they wrote the Bible as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you what that word move tonight means, by the way. That's in that text. We'll look at that too. So that's kind of where we are. So let's look at the opening introduction there. It's been called the Word of God, the Sacred Scriptures, Holy Writ, and the Good Book. We know that people revere God's Word. They revere God's word. Maybe you got. I've got the very first. No, I don't. I started to say I had the very first Bible that was ever given to me when I obeyed the truth. Of one of my best friends, who's passed on now, who had a, a tremendous hand in oh, teaching me. He gave me a little Bible, and he said, "I want you to have this Bible." And he gave it to me the very night that I was baptized. And, and he knew that he knew I was going to obey the truth. And, uh, I used that Bible. I mean, I wrote notes in the margins. I did all kinds of things. I, I used it to help convert other people. And two of the people that I helped convert was my mother and father. And when my father passed away, um, 1990, I, I put that Bible in there with him. Now I don't know. Uh, I don't know that some might want to say, well, you know, why would you do that? Well. He didn't have a really good Bible, and uh, I had told him I was going to get him a good Bible. I never did, so I gave him mine. So I don't have the first one I had, but uh, I have every other one that I've ever had, and they're sacred to me. They're sacred to you. I know it is. You know, some of us have Bibles that we've had for years and years. How many have had a Bible for many years? Okay. I see Loretta come in here sometimes, and I think she's gotten a new one since then. 
And, and one day she was walking out the side here, and all of a sudden a bunch of stuff fell out of her arms. And I, I didn't know what it was, so I was standing over there by the door, and I went over to pick it up, and I started picking it up, and it was pages from the Bible. And her Bible just fell apart. You all have seen that? Does she still use it, by the way? I think she does. Or she may have gotten a new one. But the point is that we, we revere it, don't we? But then there are also people who revile it. They make fun of it. I don't know if you've ever had to deal with that in your life, but they do. I'm, I want to give you a statistical thing. How many of you heard of the Gallup organization? Gallup, G-A-L-L-O-P. Gallup. They make polls. You know, they get surveys and so forth. Well, these are polls in 2019 and they asked the question how many do you people all over our country now I don't know how this this is supposedly a very scientific thing you may know how it works I really don't know how it works but they did this poll and they, they called all these people they talked to all these people and they asked the question how many of you believe that God's word the Bible is actually God's words in other words these are Actually, God's Word. How many people do you think believe that in this country in 2019? Anybody want to take a guess? 40%. 40%? That would be terrible, wouldn't it? would be 4 out of 10. Glenn, you got an idea? I don't know. But, um, I know some of David and Solomon's words, you know, I mean, that they're inspired men of God. Well, I mean, we're going to talk about that. How they're, they're, they're the words of other men, aren't they? We'll talk about how that came about, but who did it come from? That's the question. But let me go ahead without doing any more drama with that. One less than one in four. 24% of Americans in 2019 believe that that Bible that you wrote in your hand is actually the Word of God. Now, what's astounding to me is in 2005, which was 14 years before that, it was almost 70%. So how in the world does that happen? In fact, it's the lowest number Gallup has ever recorded in that particular survey, and they do it every year. And they've been doing it every year since the 1960s. Well, but you know what? If you listen to TV very long, of course I know that who we hear on TV is not necessarily the only voice in our country but I am so tired of hearing God's name used in vain and whoever yeah. discovered that little OMG I, 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 they need their mouth washed out with soap because yeah. that's just so popular and yeah. it's, it really bothers me when I'm watching and for no particular reason they're calling on God but for the wrong thing yeah I mean we, we kind of expect that sort of thing in life don't we we become anesthetized to it. Yeah. You know, in the Old Testament, there's there's um, words where he, he t God talked to the prophet and he talked. I mean, that, that was him talking. You know, and it's according to what, what he said. You know, the, uh, um, but um, most of the, the Jesus, he was God. He, he, he did a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of talking. And, and you got Matthew, Mark, Luke. Yeah. Know, I mean, we're going to get to all. We're going to get to all of those that you're talking about. Those are all in this lesson. But, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no. Don't you imagine, John, that the biggest reason for that is is because keeping it folded and put away, and we never read it. Yeah. So how can we build faith in something that we're not hearing? Oh. It's, a, it's a shame when you think about it because here's the thing. I hear this all the time, and people, you know, you, some of you may have said this thing, and I have. Why is it that it's so hard now to keep members of the church faithful? Or better yet, why is it so hard to convert others now? And we can say, oh, well, you know, we're not teaching like we once did. We're not as faithful as we once did. And all those things may be true, but I'm going to tell you, part of the problem is this. Part of the problem is because people today are being pulled by Satan away to the point that they say, oh, it was Or they say, like I heard on the radio today, when I was, I, I like to listen to uh, a channel. I have Sirius Radio, and maybe you know what that is, satellite radio, and I listen to one station. It's called MLB. I love MLB. You know that. 
Major League Baseball. Well, anyhow, this guy's talking about a manager who got really upset at an umpire last night, and uh, and as he was having his argument with his umpire, he gets tossed from the game. So now he's got to be interviewed after the game by the press. And uh, so he starts out being a gentleman, as you should be. Now, I'm not, now, please don't understand, misunderstand. I'm not saying this guy's a Christian. I'm just making a point to show you how we've become. So he's being what he should be. He's, he's speaking like an intelligent man. And then all of a sudden, he begins to swear. And so the guy who's doing the talk show, who's giving you the excerpts of it, he says, see, now, we know he means business because he began to swear. See, but that's how the world sees it. And I, and, and I, I can relate to that because having been a little bit in that side of the world, I can remember on one coaching stop I had, and this has been a number of years ago, and uh, I was the head football coach at this high school, and we were having a meeting. The team wasn't playing really well, and I was having a meeting with them, and I was just making them be responsible for their actions and how they were doing and so forth. And one little kid, 10th grader, raised his hand. He said, Coach, you know what will make me play harder and do better and all this? And I said, what was that? One, he goes, if you cuss more, I said, more? And then other one says, coach don't cuss. <laughs> now I'll say, you know, I'll get after them, but I'll cuss. Sometimes they hate me, that's cussing. But it ain't. But the point I was saying, he was saying was, that's what motivated him. And then some other guys said, well, I personally like not having to you know, be called every name in the book. But my point is, that's our world. We've become so enamored in this idea of Satan, that we don't really trust God's Word today. The average person. And we wonder why is it that certain things go on and don't get checked. In this, in this auditorium from time to time, I hear people say things like, I don't understand people who vote for people who uphold abortion or uphold this, that, or the other. All sorts of crimes and things that we think that are crimes to God. And they are. But now we know why, don't we? Because they don't even believe in God. Anybody ever heard of a term called theistic evolution? What? Theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is the idea that you don't believe in God because you don't believe in God because you don't believe that you don't live like you believe in God because you live like you believe in yourself and everything else. You don't believe by the way you live, it shows us that you don't believe in God. And I would say to you that most people are that way, even good people. And maybe even some that are in the church. But it's an astounding thing to me when you think about that now. And, and hopefully today we'll understand a little more. Where, okay, look at the second one. It says, where did this controversial book come from and how did we get it? Well, we're going to look at that. We're going to understand better where this book came from and how we got it. In this lesson, we will survey the history of the Bible from the ancient origins of biblical writing to the most popular translations in present day. So we're going to look back. We're going to look back to when they first wrote words down until present day. Here are five questions that we're going to be looking at. And we won't look at all these tonight, but we'll get to some of them. Where did the Bible come from? Who decided which writings would be included in the Bible? Now, by, by the way, these are questions that you yourself may have asked. People who are watching from home may have asked. What is a testament? Why is there an old one and why is there a new one? Where did all of these different Bible translations come from and why should I trust the Bible? So we're going to try to understand all of these in this first set of lessons that we're going to look at as it deals with where and how did we get the Bible. For us, there are questions that we, these are all questions we ponder and must be able to answer again. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. So we as Christians should be able to at least point someone in a direction they should know. And then, of course, the next one is one that's well known too. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved to God. So now, let's look over on the back page and we're going to look at where we got the Bible. Now, how we got the Bible. What exactly is the Bible? 
on page two, which is the back page, it says, imagine that you're in your grandparents' basement. This is what the Bible is. Just imagine you're in your grandparents' basement. Go back when you were a child. Go back when you were little. Maybe it's your parents. What are you going to find in that basement? If you're looking in a trunk or you're looking in things and their whole life is in there, what are you going to find in there? You're going to find pictures. Letters. Old pictures. Letters. Cards. Cards. Documents. You're going to find all kinds of things that begin to tell you what? About them that you may not have known. Now, I've told y'all this before. Some of you may not remember it. Maybe I'm misremembering. I don't know. I hope it. But uh, my father uh, was born in 1919. And uh, he passed away in 1990 at the age of 71. He, uh, a lot different man. He would never have done what I'm doing today. He was a farmer growing up. And he worked on a big farm with his family in South Georgia. And um, when the war came, the Second World War, he was drafted, went to the army. He had two brothers. There were seven brothers and four sisters in that family. And uh, uh, two brothers, three brothers went to the war. But anyhow, my dad was in the war, and uh, he was there. Um, he was drafted after Pearl Harbor, and uh, he was on Omaha Beach on D-Day, June 6, 1944. He was with General Patton's Third Army. They came across late in the day. He wasn't there when the, the beginning of the assault on the beach. And uh, he had three tanks that he was in the crew with that were shot out from under him. Three different times he had to crawl out of a hatch underneath the tank into the ruts that were made by him in the mud to get away. And each time, he was the only survivor in his tank. And uh, he received several honors. He was wounded in one of those, so much so that he had burn scars for many years in his back. If he wouldn't let anyone see him go to the beach, he'd never take his shirt off. Um, the way they did it in the Second World War is you didn't have soldiers, and some of you may know this, when you went to the front line, and you were in the front line, you were up there for a certain amount of time, and then you'd be relieved, and you'd go back to the behind the, the, behind the lines, and you had to have a job there, too. You couldn't, you couldn't be a tank crewman there, you had to be something different. So he had a second, what they call MOS, you know what those things are, and he was a cook. Now, why am I telling you that? Here's why. Because all the time I was growing up, the only time I ever heard my dad talk about the military, he talked about how what he learned as a cook. He loved to cook. And he could make some of the best things. He taught my mother how to cook. And I didn't learn any of the things that I just told you until he had passed away and my mother handed me all of his military records. And I began to read over. I read, read over all the campaigns he was in the commendations he received, the, the, the letters that came that were written on a typewriter, if y'all can remember that, that, where you'd have an E pop up here and something you had to kind of piece it together. Y'all, some of you remember that. He didn't want to tell me those stories because those were not stories that he wanted to remember. And some of you know things like that. You might have had parents like that too. But what I'm saying to you is I didn't know all that until I got those records. The Bible is like that. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is a history of God's people. And we're going to see as we go through this study how this all transpired and what came about and how these things were preserved for us so that we can find it. And as you go on, next next little book there, it says approximately 40 writers. Well, have you, how many of you have heard that number before, 40 writers? Do you know why they say approximately 40 writers? Anybody know? Anybody know? Has anybody read anything on that? Knows anything about it? Well, it used to be, and I've got a book. I've got an old book that I got it pretty hard on. It said 38 writers. You know why they did that? Because they counted Hebrews 
as a writing of Paul up until about 1980. And then somebody came up with the idea that maybe he's not the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. In fact, for most of my early preaching time, when I would quote something from Hebrews, I would always say, Paul said, because that's what I was told. And then I started reading some of these things. And they came out about the style of his writing. And I won't get into that tonight so much. But they came up with an idea that it wasn't him. It had to be someone else. It could have been Timothy. It could have been someone else, you know. But we don't know because it's not named. But it goes a little against this style. And then there's another one in the Old Testament. And so they just say, well, let's just put 40 in today. That's how it was. So we don't really know. So that's why the word approximate is there. And it took and, and the Bible was written approximately 1500, over a period of 1,500 years. Now, that's not 1,500 years in a consecutive order, but that's the length of time it took. This has all been verified. 66 books in the Old and New Testament, 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. And what some of you may not know is that before the actual translations into English, there were 24 Old Testament books. And we changed them to 29 because we broke them up some. Like, for example, Chronicles and Kings and all that was one consistent book. And so it was broken that way. So it doesn't really matter. That's not necessarily an inspired thing in, in and of itself. And we'll get into that. But it's historical records, letters written to specific people, to groups of people, churches, etc. Two testaments, one story. The test, testament means agreement or covenant. We understand that. And, and, and we know that that agreement was between, in the Old Testament, between Abraham and God. And uh, in the New Testament, it was uh, the, the uh, time after the, the time that Jesus lived on this earth. It records his life and uh, what, he, what his mission was, is to bring about his kingdom. Matthew 16, verses 16 through 18, we find that being given to us. Christians believe the New Testament completes the story of the Old Testament. It has one over, one overriding consistent message. The Bible does. What is it? Anybody know? Got an idea? What is the over? If you if you if you had to come up with one thing that the Bible's overall message is, old and new, what is it? God loves us. God loves us. God's love. Prophecies fulfilled. Prophecies fulfilled. Okay. I mean, you can come up with a lot of things. Yeah. God requires obedience. God requires obedience. This is what I came up with. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? They turned from God. They turned from God, didn't they? And the overall message of the Bible since then has been. Man needing to figure out that he can't quit money. He's got to quit money from God. And he's got to turn back to God in obedience and do what God says. That's why the Bible was written. That's why it's there. If it hadn't been, if that sin hadn't happened, what would have happened? Would there have been a time for Jesus to come on the earth and die? I mean, there would be no sin because man was in a relationship with God, was he not? In the Garden of Eden. And so when he sinned, he separated himself from God. He turned his back on God. And so the whole purpose of the Bible is God's wonderful plan to get man to understand, I haven't turned, you turn. You need to come back to me. That's what you need to do. And I'm going to make a plan for you to do that. And that's what this is all about. Okay. So that's kind of just a summary of the Bible, what it's about. Now let's look at question number two, which is on the outline. And, and here's where it kind of gets sort of, uh, to me, interesting anyway. What tools did biblical writers use? You know, if you wanted to write a book today, Brother W.J., if you wanted to write a book on your life, wouldn't that be a great book? I don't know about that. I think it would be. Think about all the things you've seen and heard. Or Brother Ronnie, or anybody in this audience, if you want to write a book and you decide you're going to do that, now look, a lot of us don't have that kind of uh, literary skills in the sense that we would know, you know, all the 
grammatical things to do and so forth. So we get somebody to kind of you know proofread it. But, but you, all you do is you'd open your computer, you'd open your laptop, you'd open your uh, iPad, whatever you want to type on, and you'd begin to type, wouldn't you? And you know what? If you were skilled at that and you could just put that stuff down in a short time, you'd have a book. You send it off to the editor. He check. You know, he'd make all the changes. Hey, do this, do that, and others do this. And before you know it, guess what? Uh, a thousand books are published. Approximately. What's this now? This is astounding to me. Every day from the state of Florida. That's where you live, and I live. Y'all. <laughs> I don't know what is Georgia is probably a little bit close to that. No, I, 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 I thought, what a minute, what? That's what it said. This article I consulted. A, approximately a thousand a day. That's how many people are getting down, sitting down at the computer. Okay, we can do that. In other words, the easy thing is we just turn on the computer, we start typing, and we got a book in a short time. But what you got to think about is this. What did those ancient writers do? They didn't have a computer, did they? They didn't have a pencil. Right. Now, the scribes were the copiers. They were the ones who copied down what they were doing. But the point I'm getting you to see is they didn't have these. They had primitive tools. Look at that next one. They, they wrote on stones. They wrote on wet clay or plaster, pottery, metal, parchment, and papyrus. Papyrus. What? What? Have anybody written on any of those things? I tell you, I went with Kathy one time to, uh, she was uh, taking her class to a field trip. You probably done these too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we went to one of these um, um, villages with the Indians. Uh, what's the one up in uh, Horseshoe Bend? You ever been to that one? Horseshoe Bend. And y'all heard of Horseshoe Bend, right? A big battle that took place in Alabama. Indians and Andrew Jackson and soldiers and so forth. Anyhow, now we went to this um, work thing. Kathy took a class and I was with them. She is a bus driver. But I, I, one of the things I found interesting is they demonstrated to the students how they made parchment and how they wrote on it. Anybody know how that works? I can't imagine. The skin. Parchment is skin. That's right. It, it's this animal skin. How many of you knew that? That's what it is. Animal skin. Yeah, it's cattle, uh, sheep. sheep, goats, anything. You know. And what they do is when that they, you know, they slaughter the animal, they take the skin and they and then they really, you know, clean it. They take the fur off, you know, and make blankets out of it. And then they would take that skin and they would get it. I mean, they would just scrape it down. Almost where there's nothing there, and then they would stretch it and dry it out, and they would cut it in sheets and they wrote on it. That was paper. That was their paper. And to give you some kind of a semblance of an idea, later on I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But when they would do these books in the uh, latter part of the first and second century, and they started doing what they call codices or codex singular, and they would write on these things, it might take. The skins of 200 animals to do a book. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But well, that's how they did it. That's how they wrote. That's one of the ways they did it. And so they use these kinds of things. And we know, of course, the Bible tells us. Now, people will tell you, and if you go in, and, and, and you'll run across this if you start studying, they'll say, well, look, the reason, one of the reasons the Bible isn't true is because at the time that Moses, who supposedly wrote the first five books of the Bible, there wasn't any writing going on. And uh, they didn't have an alphabet. Well, that's not true. They've gone back and found this out. Even though people said that, skeptics said that for years, and now because of archaeology, they've gone back and found out 1,500 years before Moses supposedly lived, they were already doing hieroglyphics on walls, and they were already writing on metal and, and pottery and everything else. So that doesn't hold water because we know that history is proven. The Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone. There's all kinds of evidence. It's really, really yeah. old. So, but they used all, yeah, Glenn? The papyrus held up a long time. It's on a cage. Yeah, yeah. Jesus signed the yeah. world way in there. Yeah. 
But this is how they do it. They use reed pens and ink made. Look at that. How ink was made. Look at that. Next one. It said ink made from a concoction of gum. That's uh, rosin, resin. Where does that come from? Who knows? Pine trees. There you go. With soot. They come out of the chimney. <laughs> Where did they come up with these ideas? Let me tell you where they came up with these ideas. Somebody put it in their head, didn't they? Somebody put it in their head. I mean, really, when you stop and look at this, you, you become, your faith should be even more. And then here's some things. And, and oh, if you look down, it was just parchments, animal skins. And there's a term called villain. Villain was a top of the line parchment. You know where it came from? Calf skin. They won't kill a calf. Why would you kill a calf? Real. You, you want that sucker to grow up to be a big cow, don't you? <laughs> you, don't want that, you don't want to kill him too, you, huh? But, that, but, but, you know, wealthy people wanted some top-of-the-line stuff, just like you go here to Radio Shack get some top-of-the-line stuff. Well, that's what they do. Old Testament writers and copyists preferred parchment and scrolls. And as you see, there are 200 for one book, one animal would actually be a scroll. And then uh, the virus stuff was made of plants and uh, they would cut the stems and, and uh, lay them side by side and dry them out and lay another layer over them, dry them out and glue them together. That became a form of, of uh, the way that they wrote. And uh, to begin with, when they were doing all these things, they would put them in the form of a scroll and uh, which was rolled up and most of these scrolls, I'm told, especially in the Old Testament, that had all these Old Testament books, they may have all the Law of Moses on one scroll. They may have all the prophets on another scroll. And some of these scrolls they found uh, later on were as long as 37 feet long. And so the way they would do it in a scroll was you'd be standing up there like I am right now, and I'd be uh, reading it, and I'd be pulling it with one hand and kind of rolling with another, so it would roll up here, and so that's how they read. And then later on in the first century, uh, later first and second centuries, they changed from that and went to what they call codices, which they would then take those skins and they would cut them in sheets, and they would have a, just like if you took a needle and thread and then sewed them together, and they made what they call a book. And uh, that's that was the way they preferred in the New Testament to get books written and put together. Okay. And number three, what makes the Bible different from other books? Okay, you were bringing this up, some of you, earlier. Uh, and here's what makes it different, the very first statement. It makes a spectacular claim about itself. Some 3,800 times there are phrases like, God said, thus says the Lord. The Bible presents itself as the actual word of God. I'm going to read one writer what he wrote about this, and I think this is really good. He said, God worked in and through human uh, authors, guiding them using their unique personalities and vocabularies, writing styles, and composed the Bible without errors, the exact message that God wanted. You think about that. Think about all the different writers. And we're going to see this as we go through this, uh, both tonight and other nights. And so the Bible presents itself as actually God's Word. And then the Apostle Paul, who was a devout Jew and follower of Jesus, is the one who said, all Scripture is given by inspiration. The word Scripture means writing in the Greek. And the word inspiration means it comes from the Greek word God breathed. So Paul was saying that all these Scriptures that you have written in front of you came from who? It came from God. They were given by God. Now, Lynn, you made a comment about this. Everybody look in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1. And here is another statement. And you're right about this in that God did say um, there are, you know, we hear God's words being said through the men of other men and in inspiration. But, and we know that's what Peter said. But listen to what Jeremiah said, the prophet, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Here's what he said. He says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. 
What does that mean? I put my words in your mouth. I mean, does God put his words in a Bible teacher's mouth? <coughs> Preacher's mouth? Your mouth if you're teaching someone else? Yeah. yeah, where is the power, by the way? In my words? God's words. Your words? No, God's words. But God will work things in a way that, as you'll see here in a moment, where things become what he wants them to become. And these writers that wrote the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, these were men who spoke as what? As they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. Moved by the Holy Spirit. At other times, God used unique minds, vocabularies, cultures, and experiences of human authors to convey his message. This is why there are sharp stylistic differences between Bible books. Peter was a Jewish Christian, and he wrote 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21 about holy men spoke as they were moved. He also, in that, in that same opening in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, told us that Paul's writings came from God. And so, in conclusion... There it says both God and man were involved in its production. But the result, end result, was what God wanted. I want you to turn with me in your Bible first uh, to 2 Peter. And I want you to look at two texts with me just a moment. We're going to talk about the meaning of what these and the importance of these tonight. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and, and we've quoted it, but I want us to read it together. Peter says there in verse 20, he says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecies came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were, what does the next word in your text say? Moved. Moved. Some will find that it says uh, carried away. But holy men of God spake as they were moved. Now, now, why is that important? Why is that Greek word moved there important? We're going to look at it. That's not the Greek word itself, but it's a Greek word here. Yeah. Is it true that uh, in the original writings there were no verses that were numbered? There were letters? That's, that's absolutely true. We, we sometimes, that can be misused, you know. <clears throat> we're going to mix out parts. And we're going to discuss that down the line a little bit. But that is that that was added later by some of the people who, in particular, King James and some of the others. Now turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. Now I want you to remember the word that Peter uses here, and he uses a Greek word, and the Greek word translated for us is the word "moved." Holy men of God were what moved. You think about what that word means. Now let's look in Acts chapter 27, and I want you to look at three verses of Scripture with me. We'll look at verse 15. Now we're kind of picking up something in the context in the middle of something, so just bear with me. And when the ship was called and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clara, we had much work come by the boat which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and were so, and so were driven. Now what I want you to think about is that word moved, and then this last phrase here used in verse 17. So were driven. Same Greek word. Now, what does that mean, John? That means this. Those sailors there in Acts chapter 27, they're on that ship, and there was a strong wind. What were they trying to do? What were those sailors trying to do in that in the midst of that storm? What were they trying to do? They were trying to get control, weren't they? But they figured out in that text they couldn't get control. The wind was too strong. 
They couldn't steer it. They couldn't get it to do what they wanted to do. So finally, they just let it do what? Let the wind take it where they were going to go. Were driven. And what he's saying here, and I, the reason I think this is important is because in that same word that's used there in First Peter or Second Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, which says they were moved by the Holy Spirit, is those men were moved just like those soldiers, those sailors. They were moved beyond their own. They were involved, but they couldn't change anything. They were driven. They, were, they had to do exactly, that ship had to go exactly where the wind took it. And those holy men of God had to speak and do what they said, what God told them to do, just like He wanted them to do. And they had, even though they were involved, it was God's work, it was God's will, it was God's job to get it done. And that's what He's done here in Scripture. And uh, that's, that's what we're going to see over the next several days. Now, look with me there. It says, So God directed the writings and guaranteed the accuracy of the Bible. There was a divine and human involvement, but no human agenda. So yeah, when these guys spoke, but they spoke as what? God's word. As God's word. God yeah, let them use their own unique talents. Every one of you in this audience tonight has a different talent for speaking than I do. By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, God, moved them. And but he allowed them to do what? Use their own their own skills. But in the end, they were going to do what? They were going to do God's will. They were going to do what God wanted them to do. He was leading them in a direction that he wanted them to go into. And so God is the ultimate author. So I see time has already gotten away from us. Um, next week we're going to look at uh, these original writings. I'm going to tell you how you can find some of them and, and, and the importance of that. And then we're going to talk about why there's so many different kinds of translations as we get into um, this text. And then we'll get into more of it. Thank you so much for your attention. We're going to offer the invitation tonight. And I see that it's getting cloudy out there. Um, and in just a moment, we're going to sing 504. And Brother Debbie J is going to lead us in that. We're offering the invitation to Christ. Let me, let me tell you real quickly. We talked a few moments ago about the story in 1 Samuel chapter 15 of Saul and, uh, and Samuel coming to him and telling him that uh, God would rather you obey than sacrifice. Uh, there was a story told of a little seven-year-old girl and um, she'd been in Sunday school and uh, she was doing the Last Leaders program. And some of you will remember the Last Leaders program has a lot of uh, memory verses. And her memory verse was it's better to, to obey than to sacrifice. Pretty simple. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. She was seven years old. Her mom was going over with her. And uh, thought she had it. So the next day, she had a little four- or five-year-old brother, and uh, he was misbehaving. So like older brothers and sisters tend to be, she was going to try to correct him and help mom and dad out. She thought, why well, don't she sit down? Billy, you better start behaving, or they're going to sacrifice you. <laughs> so she kind of misunderstood it, didn't she? <laughs> she did. And I think about the story of Saul. And you read the story of Saul, you read about how he was selected. What a great physical specimen he was. And what a great potential king he could be. But as his life went on, he decided it was better that he wanted to do things his way, not necessarily God's way. And so, even though the story of the little girl doesn't really represent what happened in that story, it does in so many other ways. Because you see, what happened with Saul was he lost the thing that he wanted most. He lost his kingdom. He lost his relationship with Samuel, which was a close relationship, because the Bible tells us after this, after this proclamation that Samuel had with him in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel never saw him again. He never saw Saul again. And then, of course, worse than that, he lost his relationship with God. And it can happen to anybody. Tonight we're going to offer the invitation to Jesus Christ. And if there's a need in your life and you need to respond, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.